Good afternoon. I would like to welcome you to the 12th annual Bob and Kim Griffin Building U.S.-China Bridges Lecture, which is sponsored by the University of Minnesota China Center. My name is Joan Brzezinski and I'm the Executive Director of the China Center. I'm so pleased that all of you are here and I'm certain that we will all enjoy uh, Ted Fishman's lecture today. He is the author of the bestseller China Inc. and I think he's got a lot of interesting things to say. Today more than ever, Mr. Fishman's revelations about the economic rise of China influences the world and it directly affects our university. Since 1914, more than 8,000 Chinese alumni have worked or studied at the University of Minnesota. This coming academic year, we will celebrate 100 years of exchange with China. And I hope that you will join us as we celebrate this wonderful milestone with events on campus and in China throughout the year, beginning in June of 2013. As one of the first universities to resume academic exchanges with China after it opened to the West in 1979, the University of Minnesota today is home to one of the largest populations of Chinese students and scholars in North America. We have conferred eight distinguished Chinese academics and scholars with the honorary doctorate degree and continue to work to build bridges between the U.S., um, Minnesota, and China. Universities, Chinese alumni have gone on to make amazing contributions or in many positions of influence. The China Center was established in 1979 and was the first of its kind. Um, then in 2009, we opened the university opened the, and established the first official office abroad in Beijing. Most recently, in the last two years, the university has established two American cultural centers in China, one in Tianjin and another in Zhejiang. With today's lecture, we continue to promote mutual understanding and respect between the U.S. and China. I would like to take time to introduce you to the generous benefactors of tonight's lecture, Bob and Kim Griffin. In 2005, Bob and Kim Griffin donated $500,000 to the China Center to create an endowment to fund and establish the Bob and Kim Griffin Building U.S.-China Bridges Lecture to help build the legacy for their children and for Minnesota. Bob is president of Griffin International Companies, which is one of the Twin Cities' leading ex import forms, firms, focusing on custom products developed in the U.S. and sourced in China and Asia. Griffin International Companies connects the world's most innovative and exciting brands to the nation's most important retailers. The Griffin's gift reflects their commitment to promoting mutual respect between the U.S. and Chinese cultures and their passion to connect people with China. Please welcome Bob to come and say a few words. Thank you, Joan. Good evening, everybody. It's nice to see everybody here. Appreciate you coming. Uh, and thank you for 10 plus years of support of this lecture series. It's been a very exciting 10 years. We're actually on our 12th year. And uh, we happen to see this uh, event grow each year, which is really exciting for me because that was the, the intent from the beginning. Uh, I certainly want to thank Meredith McQuaid and the Board of Directors of the China Center. And I certainly want to thank also Joan Brzezinski and the China Center staff for all their hard work to put this event on and all the things that they do throughout the year for the university and certainly for the China Center. And I have to thank my wife, Kim, of course, and my son, who's at his first lecture series, Jack. Hi, buddy. <laughs> Um, you know, for me, this lecture series has always been about understanding. It's understanding between two cultures. And uh, if, if, if you will, it's an appreciation between two cultures. It was never meant to be a lecture series about specific events. It's, it's a lecture series about understanding perspectives. I've had the good fortune of going to Asia several hundred times, and I've been able to see many things that I wish more Americans could see, so they could appreciate, and certainly would love to see the, uh, the opposite. More Chinese people come to America and understand and appreciate American perspectives. I'm extremely excited to hear our speaker today. We had the opportunity to speak before here, before this uh, lecture, and it's amazing uh, what he's been writing about and studying and learning in Asia, and for me it was a revelation of that's the things I've been living for the last 20 years. So it was a great connection, and I'm super excited to hear what he has to say, and, uh, and spe specifically China's role in the future of the world. So I want to again thank everybody for coming. I really do appreciate your attendance here this evening, and uh, thank you for supporting the Building Bridges Lecture Series. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. I'd like to introduce you to our next speaker, Professor Michael Houston, 
who is an Associate Dean of Global Initiatives at the Carlson School of Management. In that capacity, he oversees the Carlson Global Institute and also serves as Academic Director for the Center for in International Business and Education Research, also known as Cyber. Professor Houston holds a PhD in Marketing from the University of Illinois and has been a member of the faculty at the Carlson School since 1986. Teaching in both the MBA and PhD programs has allowed Professor Houston to share his marketing knowledge in the Carlson School programs around the world, including Vienna, Warsaw, and Singapore. Professor Houston is a 2012 recipient of the University of Minnesota's Global Engagement Award, and he's currently a member of the China Center's Advisory Council. Would you please well, help me welcome um, Professor Mike Houston to the podium. Thank you. Thanks very much, Joan. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to be here and to introduce our guest uh, speaker for the 12th annual Bob and Griffith, Griffin, Griffin Building U.S. China Bridges Lecture. Now, <clears throat> first thing I need to point out, you all have a green card right at your seat. This will not grant you permanent residency in the U.S. <laughs> It will, however, provide you the opportunity to write a question for a speaker to address at the conclusion of his uh, presentation. So, um, Ted C. Fishman is a veteran journalist, keynote speaker, and former commodities trader who has emerged as a leading expert on two of the greatest megatrends of our age. His 2006 international bestseller, China Inc., was published in 27 languages. It explores how the economic rise of China changes life everywhere in the world. And I, uh, when I, I look through this book, uh, he just links things that you would have never imagined could be linked back to China, but they are. It's, it's very interesting. Um, Mr. Fishman continues to follow China-related news and issues, often for the Times Magazine, as well as in his latest book, Shock of Grey, which explores the aging of the world's population. As a frequent and aging visitor to China, I now know why I was asked to introduce this speaker. Um, <clears throat> Ted recently returned from a month-long trip where he was reporting in China. In addition to his books, he publishes in many of the world's most prominent journals, including the New York Times, National Geographic, USA Today, The Wall Street Journal, Business Week, and Esquire, among others. He appears frequently on major network news and commentary programs in the U.S. and abroad. Mr. Fishman just finished a tenure as a fellow at the National Chamber Foundation, the think tank of the U.S. Chamber of Com uh, Commerce, where he is now an emeritus fellow. He's also been a visiting scholar at the Stanford Center on Longevity and a faculty director and lecturer with programs for global executives through Dartmouth's Tuck School of Business. I'm sure based on that information alone, you'll have questions for him, but um, let me remind you, if you do, write him down and we'll address him at the end. Uh, Mr. Fishman has lived and worked in, Jam in Japan and Indonesia. He is a graduate of Princeton University and currently lives in Chicago. So, on that note, please help me welcome Ted C. Fishman. Ted. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so delighted to see this atrium filled. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful sight. I've had a great welcome here. Um, not only were there posters with my name and flyers and you all got email and everything, um, but when Mike just said Ted C. Fishman, I was reminded that you also renamed the stadium for me, the TCF Stadium. Uh, thank you so much. You know, I've, just here, here, this is, this is where I feel it. Um, the Twin Cities is a great place to talk about China. It's a great place to be uh, welcome to talk about China. I want to thank my host at the China Center. I want to thank the Griffin family. I want to thank our youngest attendee, Jack, um, whose life will probably be more influenced by China than mine ever will be uh, because uh, China is an, a, a, an ascending economy, an ascending uh, global presence for all of us, and um, an ascending power, which we're going to talk about. Jack, thanks for coming. Um, and I also want to reflect a little bit on why the Twin Cities 
is in some ways an ideal place to talk about China. A lot of the ways we feel China in our lives every day are driven by some of your um, most prominent businesses and the business mix that makes this uh, metropolis a great metropolis, the retail mix, the commodity mix, um, and of course the academic mix. Those are all very important ways in which we interact with China. It also happens to be one of the places in the United, in the continental United States where you can take the fastest trip to China. Now I know I'm here in a room full of gophers, so you might feel that the fastest way to China is to dig straight through the earth. <laughs> Um, but if you did that in the Twin Cities, you would end up not in China. You would end up in a very lonely part of the ocean uh, southwest of Australia, uh, not in China at all. The, the shortest path to China from the continental United States is the Delta flight that leaves from your airport and goes right to Beijing. Uh, it's about an hour faster than Chicago. It goes right over the pole, right to China. But um, as you heard, I have just been in China. And uh, the one thing everybody's talking about uh, who's traveled to China recently is the air quality. <laughs> um, here I am in a city with pristine air, beautiful blue skies, and um, I was traveling back from China on the last leg of my flight, which was from Shanghai to San Francisco into the U.S., and I saw the Chinese people look out the window at the blue skies in the Bay Area, and they just gasped, not for air, but with air. <laughs> um, and uh, it was a reminder of some of the blessings that we have and that Chinese people deserve and crave. But there's good news in that pollution story in China, and that is that all of the carbon emissions that uh, China is spewing into the atmosphere now, it is the world's largest carbon emitter, are opening up the Northwest Passage. Um, you know, this great waterway north of Minnesota, north of the Hudson Bay. And I just read recently that some St. Olaf graduates canoed from the Twin Cities to Hudson Bay. And with the opening of the Northwest Passage, I think some University of Minnesota students should canoe all the way to China because it is newly possible. Last year, there were 46 ships that made it through the Northwest Passage from, from uh, Eastern Russia to Western Russia. One of those was a Chinese ship. You can do it now like one year out of six. You could travel all the way. And now you can actually, in those years, you can actually get a boat all the way from the Twin Cities. If you take the right way, go down the coast of Asia, stop in Qingdao for some beer, um, and then turn around and bring it back for your graduation party. And um, I heard that there's a really good women's hockey team here, which is very good at navigating ice, and that's the group we should get to do it. So, um, you know, Dan, my friend Dan Butner is in the audience, and he has several Guinness Book of World Records for Herculean feats of bicycling across the continents. And I mentioned to this to him, and I just want to tell you that if someone from Minnesota is going to do it, you better do it fast, because uh, there's some interest in this project. Um, also, the Twin Cities is an interesting place to talk about China because of what China means for the local economy in terms of numbers. Uh, about one, between one out of eight and one out of nine jobs in Minnesota is linked to trade. China is the second largest trading partner with Minnesota. Uh, when I was working on China Inc. at the time, I don't know whether it's still true, but Ch Minnesota was the only state out of all 50 states in the United States that had a positive trade balance with China. <laughs> that's pretty incredible. I mean, that's a tribute to the strengths in the local economy here. Um, and uh, there's another link to Minnesota and the Chinese economy is that you both have cities named Canton. Anybody? <laughs> um, and they have some things in common. There's very few African Americans in either Canton. <laughs> Very few Hispanics in either Canton. But I think if you go to Canton, Minnesota, you will see 
in the stores in this city of 346 people, goods that come from Guangzhou, Canton, China, uh, which are filling the shelves there, delivering a kind of lifestyle that uh, was not available before for prices that were not available before. And it shows the links between the two economies in powerful ways. Um, there's lots of concern in the industrial Midwest that China has de-industrialized the Midwest. Uh, I'm not so sure that's true. Um, American manufacturing employment is down. Uh, American manufacturing, since China started collecting industrial clusters after market reform, American manufacturing has lost around 3 million manufacturing jobs. Um, but manufacturing output from the United States is at near all-time highs. It just means that the productivity of manufacturing and the employment in manufacturing is down. Wages are also down. This pressure from Chinese manufacturing, according to the Economic Policy Institute, has put pressure on manufacturing wages around $1,700 a year negative. Um, but it's also honed American manufacturing so that it now is you know, highly automated, highly advanced, makes high value products and not the low value products uh, that can be exported abroad uh, for manufacturing. That's a big number. $1,700 from manufacturing income is a big number, but there's another side to that. The other side to that is what does the pressure from Chinese manufacturing do to the things that we buy? Uh, when I wrote China Inc. Uh, came out just at the end of 2005, uh, Chinese manufacturing, the so-called China price, which not only saves you goods because goods come from China, but it puts pressure on goods that are made everywhere in the world, saved Americans, uh, American families, around $600 a year. Now it saves them around $680. Just to put that in perspective, um, that's more money than American families got back from the Bush tax cuts, during the Bush tax cuts. It is more money than American families got back from the payroll tax hiatus that was uh, um, uh, pushed through by the Obama administration. And this is just the savings that every family gets on average from buying uh, goods that are subject to the price pressure from China. And that savings is not just to a, a group of three, you know, uh, three and a half million manufacturing workers. That is a savings to, on average, every family in the United States. And a lot of that comes from the genius that is here in the Twin Cities, you know, the big retailers here who have honed the supply chains, uh, uh, taught ch uh, Chinese companies how to be great manufacturers and to, to bring those goods here. And I don't think American consumers really understand uh, the depth of this advantage that comes to them, but we certainly would understand it if it were reversed. It's not that Chinese development, though, has, um, you know, benefited us the most. There's no question that it's benefited the Chinese people the most. Uh, since market reform began, the Chinese standard of living has gone up around 16-fold. That's huge. Uh, the living space of an urban Chinese family uh, which has been the beneficiary of the verticalization of the Chinese city. Uh, and there are costs to that. I don't want to minimize the cost of that, the displacement of families and so on. But the people who live in those modernized cities today live, uh, have for their own use around six times as much living space as they had before market reform began. That's a real change. That is a real, real change. Chinese cities are still densely populated places. They still have lively street life, but the lives people are living inside uh, allow them six times the living space that they had before. Of course, there's the ugly side of that, and um, that market reform began. Maybe some of you saw the news a couple of weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago now, where there were um, 16,000 dead pigs floating down the Huangpu River in the middle of Shanghai, the part that separates the Bund from Pudong. 
you know, 16,000 bloated, effervescing, smelly pigs. Uh, the, the photos were so vivid, it was almost like they were scratch and sniff photos. Um, and then, of course, the air quality uh, in China has been so terrible. Uh, I was in Chengdu, and there are two ways to read the air quality in Chengdu. One is to go to the official government site, and the other is to go to the site that the U.S. Uh, consul in Chengdu, um, uh, where they track the pollution levels. And every day I was there for three weeks, it was at least twice, sometimes four times uh, the danger level. And Chinese people have a fantastic gift for bearing up to these difficult situations uh, and often making light of them. And there was a joke there that maybe some of you heard, which was about the good fortune that comes from living in my, my, a modern China today, which is if you open the windows in Beijing where the particulate level was four times the danger level, it is like getting two free packs of cigarettes a day. <laughs> And if you turn on the water in Shanghai, it is like getting free pork soup. <laughs> Ugh. Um, here's what I'm going to do today in my talk. I'm going to go over some of the recent news and statistics and put those in a bigger context for you uh, about the Chinese economy. I'm going to talk about Chengdu, the city where I, I've just been reporting. Uh, to me, this is an emblem of a new phase in Chinese development, and I'll explain some of the good things and some of the danger signs there. Um, you know, up until now, and you can see this in the pages of China Inc., uh, the real economic powerhouses in China have been these powerhouse eastern cities, Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and the cities that are close to those mega cities. But now the economic development has really moved into the country, and it has changed some of the fundamental dynamics of the way China's economic uh, future is unfolding, uh, mostly because people now can realize their dreams for a better life closer to home, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I'll talk very briefly about the new leadership, its goals as far as they can be known and how they've been articulated. Uh, I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on China's one child uh, per family policy. There's been some momentous changes in that just in the last two weeks. And I think in some ways you can understand the demographics of the whole world by looking at uh, what China has done with its own population, the choices its own population has made, the choices that have been made for them, and how this really has been a propellant for Chinese growth. Um, then I'm going to talk about education, because uh, we are at a university. I'm going to talk about the potential for a creative uh, uh, economy in China. You know, China up until now has been a very successful, fast follower, copycat economy, if you will. It's been rewarded enormously for that. Uh, if you were China's leaders, you would probably want want that exact same kind of economy. But I'm going to talk about whether China can move beyond that and what will it do when it is no longer just a fast follower. What can it do to become a leader? Um, some things I'm not going to talk much about, though we can talk about them in the questions, are the geopolitical conflicts with China, the territorial disputes with the Philippines, with Japan. And I'm not going to say much about Korea, but I do want to say this, and it might be the most important thing for all of us to keep in mind uh, throughout my remarks. It is possible, and I'm guilty of this often, to look at China as a kind of snapshot, a snapshot where we have problems uh, mediating our economy, our politics with China. There are trade issues, there are political conflicts, uh, and the snapshot often doesn't look so rosy. Another way to look at China is like a scroll or a movie that's unfolded over time. And if you look back to the beginning of the movie, earlier in the century, or the beginning uh, inches of the scroll, and you unfold it or watch it, uh, it's a pretty good movie. And China's made amazing progress, and it's progress that we should all cheer. If you want to know an alternative version of that movie, look at North Korea. 
um, any of the problems I talk about with China today pale in comparison to what a bad outcome could be with North Korea. Uh, that is a very dangerous situation. It puts tariff issues, intellectual property issues, other things in a much, much different light. Uh, and we tend in our imaginations to think these problems we have with China are so huge because the country is so huge. But they're not the big, big problems in the world. China is not a problem. China is a success in the world. Um, and not to say that it doesn't have problems, it does. So uh, please keep that in mind. Here's some quick statistics about China right now. Uh, China's GDP. This is a very, very hard calculation to make. And I know there's some people in this room who probably struggle with this calculation. Uh, because there's the exchange rate calculation. There's the purchasing power parity calculation. If you just look at it in straight dollar terms, China's GDP is around $7.6 trillion. Uh, it was that in 2012. It'll be a little bit higher this next year. Uh, but if you look in terms of purchasing power parity, what can you buy with the Chinese uh, currency? Um, you have to multiply that. Uh, the number you multiply it is, 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 there's also some art in that. Um, and it's possible to do that calculation in a way that would already show the Chinese economy is larger than the U.S. economy. Um, and not by a lot, uh, but it can be a lot. And almost every calculation of the Chinese economy puts them bigger than the U.S. economy in around 2030. Um, and that's only counting the real economy that we know about, the one that's tracked in the statistics. There is a ghost economy in China where more than a trillion dollars of GDP isn't even counted uh, because it's in the back channels of the economy. And this is, I'm not talking about money that's secreted offshore or anything. I'm going to talk about that later. This is just money that turns inside the China economy. You know, another 12 to 15 percent added on top of the ch size of the economy. Chinese people have a great word for this when, when you ask them, how come it's not accounted? And they say, well, there's lots of income from other sources. Uh, that might be a phrase that many of you have heard. Um, wages in China uh, are going up. That changes the competitive picture of China and Chinese manufacturing. When people talk about an American economic um, a manufacturing resurgence, they're often uh, talking about uh, American manufacturing in light of wage inflation in China. And it's rather high. It's been double digit for a long time. It was around 9.8% last year, uh, which means you're making roughly, if you're working in a Chinese factory, you're probably making 10% more this year than the year, than the year before. Um, it has has been in recent years as high as 15, 16 uh, percent. That those are real numbers in an economy where the currency has also been going up. Uh, so that changes uh, some of the competitiveness of Chinese manufacturing. It also says that Chinese manufacturing employment is probably headed for the same kind of reductions that we've seen in the United States as Chinese manufacturers move to automate, move to become leading edge manufacturers too. Um, and that, that could disemploy a lot of people. The first wave of market reform in China in which there was large disemployment from the inefficient state-owned sector as the private sector took over manufacturing was the biggest wave of unemployment in human history. Around 70 million people lost their jobs in state-owned companies as a result of market reform. That's huge. And as automation uh, takes a hold in China, you're going to see some very, very large uh, reductions in the manufacturing workforce. That's why the creative economy w is so important to China's future, if it can get there. Um, exports from China last year were around $2.05 $2 trillion. Imports were $1.8 trillion. Uh, that gave them a positive trade balance of $231 billion. 231, keep that number in mind, because the U.S. trade deficit with China is quite a bit higher than that, quite a bit higher than China's entire trade surplus. The U.S. trade deficit with China last year was $282 billion. 
um, we are pretty much the only country that is the engine of China's trade surplus. Um, that's pretty incredible, isn't it? Uh, even though China has to buy petroleum abroad, many precious natural resources abroad, and so on, uh, the United States is more, accounts for more than 100% of China's trade surplus. Uh, pretty incredible. Um, here's some news stories that I've paid close attention to recently because they say some things about China. One was the recent series of meetings held between the new president of China, Xi Jinping, and our uh, new treasury secretary, Jacob Liu. What were the agenda items of their meetings? Well, they did talk a little bit about uh, North Korea. They talked about intellectual property protection. They talked about cybersecurity, and they talked about exchange exchange rates. In other words, they talked about all the same things we've been talking about with China since market reform began. Uh, it is the same script, just different people. And I think we will be talking about these things for a long time. Why? Because cybersecurity, I mean, uh, cyber espionage works. Copying and borrowing other countries' technology works. Um, I suppose cozying to North Korea works. Um, China's exchange rates uh, work. The fact that its currency uh, is valued lower than it would be if it were freely traded, those work, and they're part of the Chinese miracle. Uh, it's not a moral argument. Um, it's not an issue of fairness. It is China doing what China ought to do for its people. If you are the leader of a developing country, or any country for that matter, what is your job? Your job is to make your people richer, smarter, healthier, happier, and better entertained. What are the tools to do that? Borrowing the goods from the rest of the world. What's the fastest way to get richer? take things with no consequence. <laughs> China's really good at that. Uh, it's almost a moral imperative on the Chinese leadership to do this. If any of us were leaders of 1.3 to 1.7 billion people, and we could make them all healthier, happier, richer, smarter, better entertained with these four tools, would we do it? Probably. Probably. We would probably do that. China's leaders are doing what they ought to do in these regards. Um, very recently, there was the annual Consumer Rights Day in China. This was around a month ago. Um, and the Consumer Rights Day in China is all about getting the Chinese consumer the best value for the best goods from anywhere in the world they can. Who were the companies that the Chinese government identified as the villains in the current consumer economy? VW, Audi, Mercedes, BMW, all of these companies that don't deliver true value. <laughs> Not a single Chinese company named uh, on Consumer Rights Day. And why is that? Because when foreign companies are identified, it is a signal that the Chinese people ought to be paying closer attention to their domestic brands. Uh, and we ought to see that. You, you're going to start seeing that in all of these. You might have seen Tim Cook on TV recently apologizing to the Chinese people, a general apology to the whole country of China for having lapses in Apple's warranty policy. Can you imagine that happening in the United States, where a CEO of a gigantic company gets on national TV and says, we're sorry, two planks of our warranty policy were misleading. We've had deep introspection about this, and we're going to fix it, and it's very important to us. Probably wouldn't happen. Uh, but the Chinese government is going to start pushing consumers and encouraging consumers to buy Chinese smartphones very soon. So it had to happen. And of course, the United States has just announced um, guidelines that restrict the selling of Chinese uh, advanced technology on tel in telecommunications to the United States. So there, there may be a kind of tit for tat there. Um, and that is the government doing what it ought to do. Um, it didn't need to put a tariff on these car companies. It didn't need to put an extra tax on Apple phones. Uh, but it can, with the power of suggestion, uh, with public uh, displays from foreign companies, get them to reduce the power of their brands in China and to promote the Chinese. I'd like to tell you about Chengdu. Um, first of all, let me ask, who, how many people in the audience are from China? 
Raise your hand if you're from China. Okay, so you get a special welcome, and I'm asking for your forgiveness in advance for anything I say. Um, uh, most of what I know about China, I've learned from Chinese people, so uh, I, I couldn't do this without Chinese natives at my side. Um, how many of you have traveled to China? You're at a China talk, so I assume that's going to be a big number. Okay. Raise your hand if you've been to Chengdu. Wow, that's incredible. Raise your hand if you've never heard of Chengdu, be honest. Raise your hand. All right, all right, we are at a university after all. You've heard of Chengdu. Um, I've been to Chengdu several times um, over the past, well, I guess decade. It changes more than any place uh, in China that I've ever been. And maybe that's because I got there uh, before the big uh, development started happening. I did not get to Shanghai before the big development started happening. Um, in the last six years, Chengdu has added five million people. That's the entire population of Minnesota. Uh, pretty incredible. These are five million people who probably would have migrated to other Chinese cities on the east part of the country before, but now they are coming to Chengdu. And of course, Chengdu is the major city in Sichuan province, which, as most of you already know, is a small provincial backwater in China with 90 million people. <laughs> Uh, and it only has 90 million, it only has a mere 90 million people because Chongqing was peeled off from Sichuan province because it added an extra 35 million people. Um, it's an important city, it's an important regional center, and it's becoming an important global center. Um, the airport there now is one of those brand new, glistening, gigantic Chinese airports. It handles 16 million people a day, and the officials in Chengdu apologize for their measly, tiny airport. But they're fixing it. They're building one across town that will accommodate 85 million passengers a year. That will make it slightly bigger than Hartsfield uh, Airport in Atlanta, which is the world's busiest airport. Uh, in Chengdu, China, and it'll be their second airport. They'll still have one that serves 16 million people a day. Then you drive into town, and of course, there's the standard scene, which many of us are familiar with, where there are cranes everywhere. There used to be the statistic that half of the world's cranes were uh, engaged, half the world's construction cranes were engaged in the building of Shanghai. That was a phony statistic. It never existed. But when you see Chengdu, you can believe that maybe half of the world's cranes are there now. It looks like it's uh, developing a little faster uh, than Shanghai did. Um, but across town, from the airport um, is a site that you may not have heard about unless you've been to Chengdu. It is the Global Center. Anybody here drive past the Global Center? Raise your hand if you know what the Global Center is. Okay, now I can shock you. The Global Center is a gigantic glass structure with a wavy ceiling. It actually, its, its top looks a little bit like the hair of a Powerpuff Girl. It kind of go, goes like that. And it is 500 meters long. It is 400 meters wide. It is 100 meters tall. It is the largest building in the world. You could fit, you could drop into the global center in Chengdu three pentagons. <laughs> Why have we never heard of it? I've been to Chengdu several times. I've been shown around by the civic boosters, the economic development people, the local officials. Nobody has ever mentioned the Global Center. You drive by the Global Center, they don't even talk about it. It's mammoth. It's got four giant hotels, thousands of hotel rooms. It's going to have a beach in the middle, which is several hundred yards long, and it's going to have a video screen of a wild surf in front of it, which is as long as a soccer pitch. <coughs> Nobody ever says anything about it. Why haven't, if you were a city that had the world's biggest building, wouldn't that be in your promotional material? 
Well, there's a giant scandal attached to the Global Center that involves a developer, the former mayor of Chengdu. One reason China has gigantic civic projects is because gigantic civic projects have gigantic sums you could skim off of them. And it is one of the reasons for gigantism in China. And Chengdu has the world's biggest example of gigantism. <laughs> and the city has thrown a gigantic blanket of invisibility over the world's largest building. It's not in any of the promotional material. You can't even talk about it. You can't even ask those officials to show you around about it. They don't want to talk about it. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit later about where you know, some of that money goes, but one of the things to consider is this kind of corruption, which is under a spotlight in China right now, so particularly in the West. You know, there was the Bo Lai story in Chongqing, you know, and his billions abroad. Um, I spend a lot of time in other countries uh, reporting other things. One of the countries I'm really familiar with is Indonesia. I lived in Indonesia. I speak Indonesia, and I know a lot of important people in Indonesia. And one thing we always talk about is the relative corruption in different places and how corruption unfolds in some places. One thing that startles me about China all the time is how corruption, <clears throat> the nature of a kleptocratic state, is inseparable from the Chinese economic miracle. In some ways, it's the propellant of the Chinese economic miracle because the pressure on local officials to drive growth is so strong, you cannot overstate it. They get political pressure. They get pressure from within the party. They get um, pressure from their families. And accompanying that pressure are all kinds of ways for officials to benefit economically from growth propelling projects, real estate projects, industrial projects, and so on. They can be part owners. They could be the people who extract money for the rents. They can establish private companies that their family members participate in. And it pushes growth forward and forward and forward. And the reason you, when you wake up and you open your eyes in a Shanghai, in a Beijing, in a Chengdu, and you see buildings that have gone up faster than any metropolis's infrastructure in the world, it's because of that pressure. And when you see the fancy apartments that are sold there, it's because of the benefits that come from that pressure to those officials and so on. Um, and China has been very, very lucky in the structure of its corruption. It might not have gotten a modern China without the kind of corruption it has. There are other corrupt countries in the world, I'll mention Indonesia, in which lots of the money uh, that is traded hands or, or in, in ways that uh, would seem to us unseemly um, do not promote the future of the economic well-being of the state or its people. It just comes out. It just disappears. Um, and, you know, I think we, when we think about corruption in these places, we have to think deeply about how is it moving money around, how is it creating things. Um, one of the things that's happened in Chengdu, which I think is so interesting, is that the government, a uh, central government in China has allowed a limited amount of privatization of farmland in Chengdu. This is a first in China. Uh, as you uh, know, or if you've read Chinese Inc., you know uh, that all of the land in China is owned by the government, right? That's one of the ways China grew. It kind of unleashed the development rights of land that it owned and poured that into infrastructure or got developers to rent those. And that money kind of unlocked the wealth that was underfoot in China. Well, what's happened in Chengdu, since Chengdu came late to the game, it needed a way to create wealth. And one of the ways it created wealth and created a banking center in order to finance uh, its boom was to give farmers property rights to the land that they were farming that the government had previously owned. 
And this allowed them to have an asset against which they could borrow. It allowed them to unlock money they could put to, into investment pools. And what it created was a kind of network of investment funds of farmers' monies that could go into banks and the banks could lend it out. And when the banks lend it out, they could propel the development. And now you get this enormous kind of development that right now has created a construction environment that has more than a million apartments and office spaces under construction at this very moment in Chengdu. And that's the future of China. If China rolls, you know, China has an experimental mentality. Deng Xiaoping had special economic zones before the economic miracle unrolled around the country. Um, it allowed farmers to sell things in the markets, you know, that were their, their, their own uh, goods that they raise, you know, separate from the, the cooperative farms. And a lot of China's uh, evolving market economy has come with local experiments that were made into national policies. And if this is a national policy of privatizing the land and giving it to the farmers, then we haven't even begun to see the next phase of development in China in which all of that value under the feet of farmers gets unlocked, put into investment pools, and then rolls into more infrastructure, more modernization for China. And Chengdu is where you see that right now in overdrive. One of the places where that investment money is going is into a software um, development park. It's called the Tianfu Software Development Park. It's huge. I was there six years ago. There were 10,000 people working there uh, for a smattering of Fortune 500 companies. Now there are 60,000 IT workers in the Tianfu Software Park working for, among others, half of the Fortune 500 and hundreds and hundreds of other companies. Now, 60,000, that might like sound like a big number, but in Chengdu overall, there's a quarter of a million IT workers. And there are four universities which every year churn out more than 20,000 graduates in IT. And unlike high college graduates elsewhere in China, which who have a high rate of unemployment, the IT graduates from Chengdu are rolling right into the companies that are moving into, um, that are moving into Chengdu and establishing a beachhead there. Uh, and in addition to that, then there, there's also a kind of startup culture there. One of the things I did when I was there reporting recently was I went to the offices of many game companies, uh, computer game companies. Um, you know how in Silicon Valley there's this culture where people talk to one another and they trade jobs and they jump from company to company and they share expertise? A weird thing about China is you go into a gigantic tech park, like the software park, uh, and there are dozens and dozens of companies in a vast, you know, seemingly endless uh, ocean of, of towers. And there's 300 game developers in this company, there's 260 in that company, there's 500 in that company. And you say to the one that has 260, go, oh, I just came from the building next to you where this company with 300 uh, employees is making games that compete with you. Have you ever heard of them? And they go, no, I never heard of them. What are they doing? <laughs> And then you go to the next one and you say, oh, I've just been to these two other companies. You know, together they've got 500 software engineers making games. Never heard of them. That'd be interesting. I'd like to, you know, know more about them. Um, you know, because there's something about the Chinese economy that retards uh, the cross-fertilization among firms, but it is not retarding the way that firms are trying to capture the market. The one uh, way that workers move from one company to another is when they leave the company and they start their own. Um, and it's somewhat shocking to me that, you know, many of the places I visit around the world, that you visit around the world, you always hear of some part of the country that is being groomed as the next Silicon Valley. Um, you know, we're going after it, you know, we're going to have a creative economy, we're going to have a tech economy, and that this city, Chengdu, in Sichuan province, in the Tibetan plain, seems to be the one place that's really, really going after it and changing utterly fast, that they have, uh, you know, a quarter of a million IT workers there, uh, that, that is a very, f on a very fast projectile to get more, and, you know, 
talk to most Americans and they've, they've never heard of this small city of 14 million people. Now the goal of China, its urban goal, official goal, is to have a much higher level of urbanization than it has today. Right now, it's a, it just crossed the 50% level of urbanization. Uh, but the new premier, in, in his opening remarks to the Chinese people, said that among his policies and goals is to push China towards 80% urbanization. <coughs> um, that's a big number. China already has seen around a quarter of a billion people make the journey from farm to city. And this means there may be another quarter of a billion people yet to go. That means new cities of tens of millions uh, of urban residences. And, um, you know, China will sputter. Uh, it will have crises along the way, but it's still going to have a quarter of a billion more urban residents than it has today. And that's part of the future of China. That's why I think you're going to see some of these big changes in land reform uh, happening in order to facilitate this. Um, let's talk about the new leadership uh, for a minute. Oh, why don't I just uh, add one more thing about Western development. Those of you who follow the Chinese economy uh, and, and remember the growth of the GDP that I said last year at around, what was it, 7.8% GDP growth? The Western cities in China had outsized GDP growth. Chengdu had 15% GDP growth for its local economy last year as anchor of the Sichuan economy. The powerhouse cities have been pretty flat. Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, they've been pretty flat. That seven plus percent growth in China is coming from new development, new initiatives that are happening away from the places that most of us who travel to China have traveled to over and over again. Um, listening to the new leadership's uh, goals for China, of course, pollution uh, reduction has become a very, very urgent goal because of the air quality uh, problems in China. It's the one area of policy in China where I just don't see much good news. And it's not because the Chinese people don't want or crave a cleaner environment. They crave nothing more. And I'm sure there's lots of people in this room who have contested that. It's because the power of numbers of people being added to modern life in China is just too great to overwhelm. I mean, so if right now China has terrible pollution because of cars in the big cities, but China is going to have nine or ten times as many cars, you could cut auto pollution by 90 percent and you wouldn't cut pollution at all. It's a big problem. And so without a big change in technology, you're just not going to see it. And I, I actually don't see any of those, despite lots of rhetoric from China about the green economy and so on, I don't see anything that really attacks this numbers problem. Um, corruption is a big deal on the political agenda of the new leadership. Um, you might remember in 2008, when the United States had its $600 billion stimulus plan, China announced a nearly $1 trillion stimulus plan. Um, right after that $1 trillion stimulus plan, China became the largest consumer of luxury goods in the world. <laughs> um, and right now, around 50% of all luxury goods that are sold in the world go to Chinese consumers. Um, and Chinese people feel this. They feel the corruption so deeply. Between 2000 and 2011, according to Chinese government's own statistics, um, around $3.7 trillion was siphoned out of the Chinese economy illegally into accounts and investments abroad. $3.7 trillion. That's half of the current GDP. Last year, the number of, for money that disappeared was around 600 billion. That's huge. That is a huge number, a huge problem, and that is on the watch list. I thought it was really interesting when Tim Cook was being criticized uh, by Chinese officials. One of the things that Apple was accused of or was said to do was it was said to be a tax cheat around the world. It doesn't pay corporate tax. It works very hard to pay no corporate taxes anywhere. 
Um, that's one of, one of the official pronouncements in China about Apple, and yet nobody's really identified a, 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 a Chinese company that's any part of this nearly $4 trillion of money that, dis that has disappeared. Um, land reform to promote urbanization is also a big agenda. Uh, as I said, China wants to get to 80% urbanization, and then streamlining the government and moving more government functions into private firms. This is a huge opportunity for business elsewhere in the world. The rail ministry has just been eliminated and turned into a corporate entity, or actually into one, two or more corporate entities. Uh, and I think you're going to see more on that. Now I want to turn to the one-child policy and spend just a few minutes on that, and then we'll wrap up. As you know, around 30 years ago, uh, at the urging of Deng Xiaoping, China enacted a one-child per family policy. Um, a lot of people think that this policy grew out of fear that China would face some sort of Malthusian nightmare which, where food supplies could not keep pace with rapid population growth. Uh, there might have been some of that, but the the deep reason for the one-child policy did not have to do with food. It had to do with the economics of the state. Uh, going into the market era, uh, Deng Xiaoping did not see how China could afford uh, to feed, provide health care, um, uh, to provide social services for large families going forward. Um, and that the large family in China was bankrupting the state. He also looked around the rest of Asia at some of the miracle economies that had already uh, firmed up, and he looked at Japan, Taiwan, Korea, um, and he noticed that there were very low uh, fertility rates in those countries, you know, below replacement rate. And the benefit of that, uh, that accrued to those economies, uh, that as those economies made the transition to low birth rates, they had very low dependency ratios, fewer older people to take care of, fewer children to take care of, and they had very large working age populations, and that propelled the economic mir that helped propel the economic miracles in those other states. And Deng Xiaoping wondered, and Chinese policymakers wondered, could China do this in reverse? Could we drive down fertility rates? and then get our economic miracle. Has it happened? Yes, certainly it's happened. Uh, Chinese families are smaller by law now. They're not all one-child families. About 40% of Chinese families are not one child, uh, but the three-child family is very rare. The urban one-child family is common. If you work for a state-owned industry, you also uh, pretty much uh, are only allowed one child. Um, but with the smaller Chinese family, what's happened inside that family? Well, far more resources have been directed towards the one child or the two child than the resources that could have been directed to each of four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or the ten children of the hero mother that Mao advocated for. And China has gone from having virtually no real credible international university system to now having a pretty good university system, although there's probably still not any universities as good as the University of Minnesota in China. The students are as good, uh, but the teaching's not as good. Um, the students are phenomenal at China's top universities, and they teach each other. Um, China now graduates uh, more university graduates than India and the United States put together. It's paid for mostly by families. Uh, there's almost nothing a Chinese family won't do to educate a child. Uh, that's how you push your economy up the value chain of global economies. Um, as I said, in Chengdu, they're graduating 20,000 IT grad, just IT graduates a year from the universities in that one city alone. Um, and the calorie uh, count for the one child is higher than it would be for each of multiple children. Uh, the amount of attention that comes from adults is higher. 
And this is another part of the Chinese miracle. During the fertility reduction in China, one of the things that has happened is that rural grandparents have come to the cities to take care of their one or two grandchildren. In other words, parents who were left out of China's economic miracle because their kids went to the city, because they were left behind in an aging, probably impoverished, rural locale, have come to the cities to reattach themselves to the family, provide services for the family, child care, cooking, and so on, for no cost. Uh, and maybe in so doing also guaranteeing their own future in old age. Maybe their kids will take care of them if they provide services to the grandchildren. And this has been one of the key ingredients in China's miracle and attractiveness for the rest of the world. When you hire a young adult Chinese worker, you just don't get that worker for 140th, between 140th and 110th an American wage. You also get the services provided by their parents for child care, cooking, shopping, everything for free. You get two workers for one. So as China goes through this demographic transition and women are more educated, more college educated, there's fewer people on the country, this part of the miracle will disappear. You will get one worker for the cost of one worker. And that will double the cost of doing business in China. Why is there wage inflation in China? People want a better life, but they also have to provide services that they used to get from their parents for free. Child care, among others. And they have to take care of their aging parents because their parents ingratiated themselves back into the family bargain by taking care of the grandchildren. Um, don't believe me? Look at Japan. Japan has had low fertility for a long time. The parents don't come to live with the children anymore. The parents were part of the miracle generation that is the young people in China today. The kids in Japan, they never leave home. <laughs> They're attaching themselves to the parents because their entire lifetime earnings will never buy uh, an apartment for the cost that would cost them in Tokyo. They need their parents' apartment. And China is going to go through a similar transition where this miracle generation will be no longer uh, the beneficiary of parents who take care of them. They may be the beneficiary of children who take care of them, and that will reduce the workforce even more. Um, what happens when China goes through this change? Well, it has momentous consequences for China, as I've just explained, but it also changes the economy of the rest of the world, because then China starts outsourcing jobs. Um, manufacturing moves from China. Last year, China lost 3.45 million people from its, man from its workforce overall. That number is going to go up every year. Um, a Chinese official recently told an official at the World Bank that over the next uh, two decades, China expects to outsource 85 million jobs to Southeast Asia. That's just to Southeast Asia. That's not even Africa or Latin America or wherever else they would shop. And those are going to fall into places that now have higher fertility. A lot of those jobs are going to go to Indonesia. It's going to accelerate Indonesia's modernization, its urbanization, if it could be accelerated accelerated any more than it already is. Uh, and it's going to drive down uh, family size. And in that way, China's demographic shift is part of the prosperity equation for much of the world. It's a kind of wash, rinse, repeat cycle. Urbanization, education, outsourcing jobs, urbanizes another place, that place gets educated, uh, and you keep rolling to the next place. But China now has shifted its one-child policy officially. It has moved it from a family planning bureau to an economic planning bureau, and it's basically defanged most of the enforcement functions of the family planning bureau, which has half a million people on, in its employ. So, Basically, in China, you can ignore the one-child policy uh, from, you know, as of three weeks ago and have as many kids as you want. Will it make a difference in China? 
Not if Deng Xiaoping's observations of other uh, Asian economies holds true for China too, which is that its prosperity will keep its fertility level down. Even without a one-child policy, China will not change the one-child practice. And there is a place in China where there's actually experimental evidence on this. It's called Chengde. It's northeast of Beijing. Families can have as many children as they want there. It's one of these experimental places that China rolls out from time to time. 50% of the families there have two children. 40% have one child. Three have, I mean, 4% have three children. And um, the rest have no children whatsoever and no intention to have any children. Uh, and, you know, the average comes out quite below replacement levels of fertility. Uh, and very close to what China's level of fertility is right now, which is 1.5 per, 1.5 children per woman, per woman on average. Interesting. Um, you know, so China is a big country. One of the things I say in China Inc. is almost anything you can say about China, you can contradict with another fact about China. You know, it's, it's, it's populated, but it's losing population. Um, it's a country of farmers, but it's most rapidly urbanizing and so on. One thing that China never stops doing is it never stops surprising. Uh, this is a great environment to study the surprises, to talk about the surprises, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. We're now going to sit down and do some casual Q&A. Um, I hope that you've submitted some questions for Ted to address. Uh, can you say a little bit about the pressures on rural Chinese who have not benefited from the Chinese market reform? What will the Chinese government, if anything, do to address this issue? All right, so that's a really interesting question. Um, there are around 80 million Chinese families who are worse off than they were when market reform began. Uh, so it hasn't been a miracle for everyone. 80 million is a big number. Uh, it's, you know, keep that in proportion to what you know is the size of the Chinese uh, population. It's around 6%, I guess, 6 or 7% of the Chinese population. Um, so rural families have long been the victims of uh, you know, all kinds of evil practices against them. Um, as recently as five years ago, there were more than 250 different taxes that poor farmers faced. Uh, this was a scandal in China. The Chinese government streamlined that and did away with some of those practices that levied all those taxes against them. Um, rural families um, also uh, suffered from the demographic shift in China. So many rural communities simply had no young people in them at all, uh, except for the occasional grandchild who was sent back to the country to be with grandparents. Uh, and uh, this was a problem in governance of, of those communities. Uh, so now one of the things that's happening in China is that because of the push for urbanization, there's also a push to consolidate the farms of China and to make the farms bigger. And when you make farms bigger, uh, you can make them more productive because you could bring in a farm machine. Uh, you could have uh, more rational uh, planting of the crops. And uh, you know, if you think about the history of Minnesota, for example, it used to be a state filled with lots of small family farms. Um, now it has a much smaller number of very large farms and the average age of a farmer in Minnesota is in his upper 50s. Um, you know, that's sort of what's happening in China, is that the age of the farmers is going up, the size of the farmers of the farms is growing. Um, that doesn't mean that there's not lots of rural poverty in China. There still is. But the government has recently also extended a pension program to farmers. It's measly, but it's a beginning. I think as... Uh Kind of a natural follow-up to that question and answer. On the f it's kind of at the other end now, why would Chinese China's leaders aspire for 80% urbanism? 
Yeah. Um, well, this is the experience of the world that uh, urbanization just brings higher. It brings higher incomes, brings better health. Uh, it also brings, you know, some benefits to longevity. You know, it's a mix. It depends on what the quality of life is back on the farm. You know, if the quality of life back on the farm is, you know, bad water, um, hard scrabble living on a subsistence farm that doesn't produce uh, enough crops for your family, uh, then you want to get people to the city. But it also wants a different kind of farm sector. It wants a farm sector that can do large-scale agriculture. Oh, that's one of the reasons. You know, these things are all controversial, and it all depends on the stage of your development. You know, there are plenty of countries where people in rural areas live long, healthy, happy lives, but they tend to be pretty developed countries. And there's also countries in the world where the cities are the most dangerous places where people live much shorter. Um, you know, um, you know, over the course of the Industrial Revolution, cities have gone from places uh, where people lived far shorter lives to places where people live uh, longer lives. <laughs> I, you know, I want to add one thing to that. You know, a, a sad thing about China's modernization, it is really the only, you know, developed, semi-developed country where um, the human lifespan is not growing longer. You know, almost everywhere in the world, we're adding about a year and a half to two and a half years to the human lifespan every decade. Uh, in China, because of pollution and stress and other things, um, you know, there's some evidence that longevity is going backwards for pressed urbanites. Hmm. That actually... Uh, I had an experience in Beijing that relates to the air, the air quality. My first time in, in Beijing suggested to me that their air quality problem has the potential to be solved. And, and, and let me explain. I was there in late 2007, before the Olympics. And it was like fall in Minnesota. I mean, the skies were blue. The sun was shining. It was, it, it was very nice. I was there last September. It's, it was just like everybody says. So that 2007 experience tells me that somehow they can deal with this if they want to. You know, the car is such an essential part of modern aspiration in China that they are adding thousands of cars to the roads every week in a big city like Beijing. I think it's a thousand cars a week or something in Beijing. Um, and uh, it's, it's hard to stay ahead of that. You know, China did seem to be making progress on its emissions when its factories were modernizing and before the car culture kicked in. Car culture really kicked in right after SARS when people wanted their own personal mm. family car. And then once cars became part of that aspiration, uh, the, it was, it's been impossible to stay ahead of the pollution. Hmm. There's also natural disadvantages in a lot of Chinese cities. You know, Beijing is in a very strange place. Uh, geologically, I guess, or geographically, right? It has big dust storms. It's, it's, it's kind of in a desert. Uh, Chengdu is in a gigantic val valley where you only see a few days of sunlight a year. Uh, the women like it, they say, because it gives them really nice skin. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, there, there are those kinds of limits, too. So um, here's an interesting one. What's the likelihood that China is in a bubble that will pop? What's the likelihood that China's in a bubble or Shanghai? China. China. Um, wow, I am so reluctant to answer that question. Um, I've been hearing the bubble thing since the first time I read anything about Chinese modernization. Um, everybody always predicts the Chinese economy is going to collapse. Somebody's going to be right eventually. <laughs> You know, somebody's going to be the Dr. Doom who makes a lot of money consulting after they predict it on the right day. Um, 
One of the things that I think is um, scary right now is uh, that the stimulus money from the Chinese um, you know, stimulus plan is, is spent. Um, there seems to be a clampdown on uh, corruption, so a lot of the conspicuous consumption that you might have seen a year ago isn't going on right now. There's a lot of empty hotel rooms, a lot of empty banquet halls, uh, and the, the people in hospitality I talked to said it's all due to the clampdown on corruption. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you just wonder, you know, when that money stops being spread through the system, you know, does that reveal all kinds of other weaknesses? Right. Someone said that the U.S. needs to be more like China to solve its problems, and China needs to be more like the U.S. to solve theirs. Any comments? Well, I love the title of the Griffin Lecture, Building U.S.-China Bridges Lecture. Uh, because when I think about China, I always think about bridges and how, you know, Shanghai built nine gigantic glistening bridges in the amount of time it took to do a feasibility study for a pedestrian bridge in my Chicago neighborhood. <laughs> um, you know, and there is something, you know, about that speed. Um, but, you know, I don't really know the ways, you know, I, I, I really... I'm sorry, Mike, I just really don't know how to answer that question. Um, you know, there are, of course, things we can learn from both countries. You know, China desperately needs a creative economy. I didn't really get to talk about it in my talk, but it's very far from having one. There's all kinds of limits. And, and uh, uh, in the United States, you know, may need to get out of its political gridlock. There might be advantages to our political gridlock, but, um, you know, we may need to streamline it. But you that's know, the most controversial yeah, thing you've said. That's the thing, right. <laughs> that I don't know whether political gridlock is good or bad. Um, uh, but, you know, I, don't, I actually don't know what from China we would profitably borrow. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, what do you think of the success rate of U.S. large corporations taking on the China market? And what about China companies entering the U.S. market? Um, well, Chinese, um, the Chinese market is becoming increasingly difficult for our big, uh, you know, joint access to technology, and uh, that will be something that American companies will have to be very, very smart about uh, in managing, you know, the outflow of technology that comes once China starts purchasing in the middle level of American industry. So is there the opportunity for the U.S. to attract further investments from the People's Republic? Um, who here has been on a trade mission or a mission of any kind to China? Raise your hand if you've ever been on a trade mission from China. So Minnesota sends a lot of trade missions to China. They send them all the time. So you listen to politicians in Washington and China's the enemy, China's the devil, China's eating our lunch. And then you go to any municipality, any economic development group, uh, a governor's office, a mayor's office, and they are just going to China in a long, endless parade to get Chinese companies to invest in the United States. And it's like there's two different Americas. There's the America at the center, you know, in Washington, which is, the, uh, oh, China bad. And then there's the other is, oh, we don't have enough red carpet for you. We'll have some more tomorrow. Please come back. Please come tomorrow. Um, and I think these local players are going to win uh, because they have the projects and they have the business connections. And, um, you know, and China has the appetite. They, they want a welcoming home. So if you're... If your locality is looking for Chinese businesses to come there, um, the first thing you ought to do is build a really nice hotel. <laughs> you know, sometimes I do talk to these localities, like I won't say the name, but a northern Midwestern city, not as big as Minneapolis, really wants Chinese business. They don't have, like, anything better than a Holiday Inn for anybody to stay in. It's like, that's uh, not going to work. Uh. <laughs> Well, since we're at a university, can you talk a bit about education in China, the differences between China and the U.S.? Do uh, you have any suggestions for international students? Um, 
Well, Chinese education today is a far cry from what it had been. So in terms of progress in the timeline, it's very wonderful. Um, but there's a lot of education in China which I would say prepares you to get educated once you leave the education system. So you might not leave school with the skills you need, but you might leave numerate enough, capable enough to learn the skills that your company needs to teach you. Um, but they're not doing the kind of job for their students that this place is doing for its students, for example. Another problem with Chinese education that Chinese people complain about a lot, although they can't give it up because there's value in it too, which is how much of the early education depends on rote learning. You know, as soon as you get to school, you start a path towards memorization and schooling by memorization at a time when American students are involved in creative, imaginative play. And once you lose it from those early years, it's very, very hard to recapture it. Um, and so in the private school space in, in China's more prosperous cities, um, forward-looking parents are sending their children to schools that allow for some sort of imaginative part of the early childhood curriculum. This somewhat related follow-up question. What advice can you offer to students here and young people who are seeking careers that involve U.S.-China relations? Mm other than learn to speak Chinese. Yeah, okay, uh, so let me, remind me, I wanna come back to that, because there was a second part of the last question that I forgot, which is about foreign exchange students here in the yeah. US. Um, we were talking about they don't, and, but They don't have to be foreign exchange. We have a lot of directly enrolled students from Okay, China. directly enrolled students. Yeah. So I saw this really sobering statistic in, uh, about foreign students in American universities, and I just want to share it with all of you, because I think it's all of our missions to overcome this, which is 40% of foreign students in the United States report that they don't have a single friend. That is a very sad thing. It's bad for our image. It's bad for their happiness. It's bad for the future of the world. It's bad for our soft power. Um, we have to find, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here because this is the China Center's program, but, but we all have to find a way to reach out beyond the circles we're already in and make sure that, you know, these students' experiences are good, that they're getting something from the United States. There's another thing, too, and I want to say this if there are any Chinese students in the audience, which is, as more Chinese students come into the United States, there is a tendency to cluster with more Chinese students, and you don't get your real American experience. You know, part of being educated here are the informal parts of the education, and um, whatever you can do to join a club, get out, uh, do any kind of activity that takes you away from the clique you're most comfortable in is an essential part of your education. And if you know anyone who can help you with that, turn to that person and start doing something else. Mm -hmm. um, and then the question, the other question. What advice can you offer students and young people seeking careers that involve U.S.-China relations? Okay. Um, so there's two parts to that question. If you want to work in China, uh, work with Chinese people. China is a complete economy. It does anything and everything. Get good at what you're doing and go look for a job that has to do with China. Uh, you know, that's, that's how you do it. You know, um, I'm meeting people doing all kinds of unlikely things in China. You know, they're grooming horses, they're uh, creating video games, they're teaching art, uh, they're starting pizza parlors, they're starting yogurt places, anything and everything. Uh, you just be really good at it. It's, it's a demanding competitive marketplace, uh, but if that's what you're interested in, that's the market you'll figure out. Um, in terms of China relations, if you're really interested in just the relations part of it, um, I, don't, I don't really have a good answer to that beyond a conventional answer. Mm. I'm sorry. Yeah. Here's, no, this is an interesting question, and, and it's one that I probably will think about for a long time. Um, we tend to view China's development through the Western lens of capitalist consumer development models. Um, is there another model that we can use to view China's development? Gosh, that's a really complicated question. Wasn't yeah. it fascinating the last political season how 
the political debate seemed to be like who could get the government more off your back, get the most out of the economy because China's eating our lunch, the country where the government is the most in the economy. <laughs> You know, I think that's like a total irony. It's like, how are we going to beat them if we do the complete opposite? You know, and have no plan. Um, uh, you know, China does have a different model, but it's an evolving model, and it's a different. It's almost like a different model every year. Um, when I started researching China Inc., the model was the private sector superseding the public sector. And I thought, oh, that's going to be the end of all the state-owned industries and everything like that. And 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 once wealth started emerging, all those really smart players in the public sector, smart, sometimes greedy players in the public sector, found ways to reassert the state-owned industry. And that's becoming more dominant than it was five years ago in the Chinese economy. Um, so yes, there are other models. I just can't tell you what the model is today. Yeah, right. I'm going to start looking for it. <laughs> um, OK, uh, this question came in early, but I've purposely saved it for last, because um, it's asking a lot. <laughs> um, from the perspective of uh, an expert, an American expert on China, uh, can you foresee what China will look like in 10 years, 20 years? in terms of the economy, politics, diplomatic relations? You know, there's no science fiction on Chinese TV or in the movies, you know, Chinese science fiction, because the government really doesn't want anybody postulating on a speculative version of the future. <laughs> Um, and you don't want to say what's going to happen in 400 years because it might conflict with the thousand year plan. Yeah. <laughs> um, so 10 years, I guess that's kind of a modest uh, prediction. You know, I think, you know, somebody asked, is China a bubble? I think China is going to go through some economic convulsions and reversals. Uh, and I think it's, I feel kind of comfortable saying it might be within the next 10 years. Um, but I think the place to focus on China is the long run now that the market economy is out of the bag. So if you look at the United States since the Industrial Revolution started really taking shape around the time of the Civil War, our standard of living has gone up 35-fold. We've had everything happen to this country. We've had um, flu epidemics, wars, uh, recessions, depressions, uh, political stasis. Um, you know, we've uh, had a whole half of the population entering the electorate uh, anew. And yet, with all depression, uh, it was terrible. It took the stock market 60 years to get back to even after the depression in real dollar terms. And yet, our economy has still offered 30 times the standard of living that it had before. And I think China will have these reversals, but in the long run, it's going to be up and up and up, unless they do something calamitous to reverse it. Hmm. Kind of a two steps up, one step back, two steps up. Yeah. 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 OK, thank you, Ted. Thank you. Fascinating, Thanks, very fascinating. I'm going to turn it back over to Joan now. Thank you, and um, please join me for another round of applause for Mr. Fishman. Thank you very much. <laughs>